Uh, going to get started. There may still be a few people straggling. Thanks for for those of you coming over from Pitt. Thanks for coming and finding this place. It's not the easiest room to find. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Dr. Sergey Plis, uh to give. I believe this is the fourth distinguished lecture for the Center of Co Center for Causal Discovery. We'll call it the fourth. Um, Sergey did his undergraduate work at the um, Kovrov State. Did I completely mispronounce that? Probably. Uh, State Technological Academy. Uh, they came to the United States for his graduate work um, at the University of New Mexico and Los Alamos Natural, National Labs, getting a PhD in computer science in 2007. Uh, he is now an assistant professor of translational neuroscience uh, and director of machine learning and neuroscience at uh, the Mind Research Network in Albuquerque. Uh, as well as the Vice President for Research in Datalytic Solutions. Um, I'm happy to say that precisely because I didn't realize your titles, and uh, they're, they're impressive. Um, along the way, Sergey's really built a, an impressive uh, research program that uh, belies his youthful appearance, um, and is really focused on developing new, as well as applying existing methods uh, from machine learning to very large, very complex data sets, especially, I think, uh, a big part that he's going to talk about today, uh, brain and neuroimaging. Um, and in particular, I think this work often is really aiming to find underlying mechanisms, not simply describe the data, which makes it really, I think, a great fit for a lot of the kinds of problems and approaches we're trying to use in the Center for Causal Discovery, the CCD. Uh, so without further ado, check it. Thank you, David, for introduction. I, I will I will really listen to it when I'm depressed. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you uh, to the center uh, for inviting me to give that lecture and uh, a chance to share some of the recent work that we've been doing. That's uh, so. This this is a progress report more than like oh, look what we've achieved. Well, it, it is like look look what we've achieved, but we're still doing the work. So. Um, Treat it as such, uh, and uh, also it's not all of my all my work, or rather none of it is my work solely. Uh, I have a lot of collaborators, and uh, the general disclaimer: if you see errors, they're probably mine, and if uh, the good stuff, it's probably my collaborators. So this is a long talk. That's why I want to give you an overview of the parts up front, what you're facing. Uh, to, to, you know, to go through in the next hour. And uh, I will talk about these four parts, and they actually split uh, unevenly. The last part will take half of the talk. So some definitions, what we're working with is, it's, oh, interesting. The, the brain is cut off, but that often happens in fMRI, by the way. Uh, so uh, new, uh, this is neuroimaging. It's a study of brain, uh, brain function and produces immense amounts of data. And data comes in various forms uh, called modalities. Uh, uh, you co collect the data differently. And then each modality has its strengths and weaknesses. And our goal is to use that data, uh, different uh, varying information, to infer causal relationship uh, among brain networks. And uh, maybe we will be happy with inferring any any useful relationships, not just causal. So, but causal seem to be like the ultimate goal. So, what we're working with is functional MRI, and uh, functional MRI measures blood oxygena oxygenation level dependent response, uh, so metabolic response basically, and produces 4 D data, three dimensional volumes evolving in uh, in time. And the strengths of fMRI is it's relatively well localized. You, you know where the signal is coming from. But uh, weaknesses, it has a low sampling rate. And there is another weakness. It, it is suffering from an inverse problem if you're thinking about, uh, people don't often bring that up, but if you're thinking about neural activity, there is a heavy inverse problem in time domain of when stuff happens. It's not just delay. It, it is uh, multiple things can lead to the same solution. Uh, then. Uh, this one shouldn't be chopped off. MEG rarely gets chopped off. Uh, magnetoencephalography measures magnetic field. And the strength of magnetoencephalography is you get the signal right away when it happened because it measures uh, electrical, uh, well, the magnetic field, of, uh, which is caused by electrical signals that pass in dendrites of, uh, cort of uh, cortical cells. Uh, then uh, weaknesses is uncertain spatial location. Uh, again, an arguable statement. Uh, some, most of MEG people will tell you, well, we can get to this almost comparable resolution that the fMRI can, 
but uh, still not without difficulties. It's not straightforward. You have to solve uh, ill-posed uh, inverse problem uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, for both of them, we assume, and we think, uh, uh, well, all of the researchers who work with me, that it's a reasonable assumption that, okay, well, the same neurons cause both of the signals. Uh, and uh, so we have a latent uh, that causes, uh, uh, or generates MEG and generates fMRI. And we'd like to use both of those data sets simultaneously to infer the underlying relations. That's the, that's the key. That's the that's the difference between when you talk about inverse problem or fusion in this field, you usually talk about real, uh, inferring neural activity. But uh, we want to go just a little one step ahead uh, beyond that uh, inferring relations. Uh, and some th those are j just definitions. We will use Bayesian network in this talk uh, in some of the slides. And Bayesian network is, uh, well, I assume everyone familiar, but still uh, it's a parameterization of a joint probability distribution as a product of families. And you can see, uh, you can see like a family here, but it's uh, the relations encode the for this three, say this is amygdala, hippocampus, and uh, uh, what is Hippodalamus and hippocampus. It's not just pairwise relationship. It's got it's a nonlinear joint distribution uh, of the three, and uh, this is what we'd like to learn. And this was one actually from real data uh, from in the brain space from the top. Uh, then uh, another another thing we will be using is graph characterization matrix. When we get graphs that are very dense, we uh, don't want to. Uh, We'll look at this amount of data and analyze what is happening. We'd like to have a number that would tell us, oh, those groups are different, or those conditions are different, and we'll use the st standard. So, uh, some some people, or often people, say, well, uh, multimodal analysis is nice, but we can live without it. We can get something more than we have, but we don't really need it if we're learning something about the brain. So uh, let me show you just one case uh, where uh, actually that is a dangerous approach uh, to say, and I think it generalizes to other areas. So we have a cohort of subjects, and we have the same paradigm, same experiment. Uh, we collect MEG and fMRI. We cannot collect it simultaneously in the same machine, uh, so we collect it on different days. But those are the same subjects, same experiments. And we analyze or process that data as as close as we can to get a similar uh, out, output of pre-processing as we can. Like uh, we pro project data into cortex space for fMRI. We only look at the cortical uh, cortical ROIs in fMRI, and then we take the average ROI signals, and then we quantize and learn the networks, uh, Bayesian networks using MCMC approach using the same methods, and then we analyze and compare structures. And this is what we get. Uh, this matrix is, this is, by the way, uh, oddball, uh, auditory oddball task. And we have standards, novels, and targets. We ignore standards that are too frequent and look at the difference between targets and novel conditions. I don't know, do I need to, uh, anyone doesn't know what the paradigm is, should I say, uh, do I need to explain? No, no. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the matrix is marginal distribution of the edges uh, that we get after MCMC procedure, and this is about 1,000 uh, well-fitting networks, and uh, those are just an example high-scoring high networks uh, for for uh, conditions and uh, modalities, and so for me it's hard to make any conclusions from just looking at this data like that. Yes, I see a lot of information, but and I even see some differences between modalities. But like, for example, if MRI is denser than MEG, but are the networks really different, uh, say, in some global properties or like, like uh, what, ha what is changing uh, from one condition to another with respect to one modality to another? So we go into graph metrics, uh, measuring global properties of those graphs, and compare those conditions. So look just at the red histograms, which are a number of outgoing, it's an out degree, basically, number of uh, children 
averaged across all of the thousand likely networks generated by MCMC structured learning procedure. Uh, and of course, within within a given network. And if we look at MEG data, uh, novel and target conditions, we see an interesting pattern that for novels, so target, uh, the person is expecting a target because they need to make an action, press a button or do something with the target. And for novel, uh, they don't, uh, it's just oh, something interesting. So they do react to it and the signal, uh, you see an increased signal, but they, they're not expecting anything. So, and you see that from the difference between novels and targets is here, you get suddenly for targets, you get a lot of high degree nodes. So if you think back into small, small world networks, it's, you suddenly get a lot of hubs, your network becomes more efficient. Oh, interesting paper, let's, let's go and publish it on MEG, right? We, we have some of that. But if you, if you assume you, well, you, well, as we did, you only collected fMRI, right? You don't have MEG as a reference. And you do the same and you say, oh, well, in novels, I have a lot of hubs there and in targets, they suddenly disappear. That's interesting. The network in novel condition is more efficient than in target condition. So uh, you're, you, by doing the same, the same, well, as much as possible analysis uh, <coughs> and, uh, data collected for different modalities. And note here that we, image, we take average uh, ERP epoch data, and we um, add sampling, uh, like basically smooth out fMRIs, so they look the same. They're on the same time scale. We artificially pressed it there, but they look at the same time scale, and and you get a different conclusion. So uh, for people who think it is safe to just stay with one modality and multimodal fusion only will get us, uh, you know, some delta in terms of what we can learn this is an example and that was our example uh, well that that wasn't a hypothesis driven research by the way so we saw it and like, oh that's scary uh then we, we didn't know that would, would happen because we thought maybe we will find something that you know well, they're, they're, they're doing the same and there is only one like delta information that we can get of uh, fusing them so uh, but nevertheless uh I interpreted it as an invitation to do common joint analysis, uh, although you may argue, uh, but it's, uh, I strongly feel like we should analyze whatever data we have available in order to infer what's happening, uh, in order to avoid conflicts like that in conclusions. And so one of the ways to do that, and we've tried it for, with a single ROI for a reason that I will explain in a couple of minutes, is uh, just dynamic Bayesian network or a hidden Markov model, if you wish, with one uh, hidden variable. It's that ROI there and uh, forward models. Basically, we generate uh, square nodes are observed and uh, images sampling rate is much higher than fMRI. So that's why uh, often we don't observe fMRI. So we infer the square nodes uh, as we go and we use particle filters to do that. And uh, for MEG forward model, it's uh, it's an easy linear transform after you know the locations of uh, voxels or of dipoles in the brain, no linearity goes away, it, got, got, it, it gets absorbed into a matrix. So uh, it's a simple forward model here, but for the bold response, it's actually a, differential equation system, original differential equations, four of them. So it's kind of another dynamic Bayesian model built, built in there. And uh, we get interesting results. Uh, we have tons of simulations, but I don't have time in this talk to talk about them. But this is real data, just this one ROI. And if you have fMRI only, this is how you estimate, uh, how the model estimates the underlying neural activity. And this is a flickering checker, uh, checkerboard stim, uh, stimulus uh, experiment. Just one subject, uh, one experiment. And this uh, gray bar there is when the checkerboard was flickering, basically. So if you if you apply the same model to uh, bold to just MEG, you already see some activity here, but obviously the model doesn't track the bold response. And it doesn't track the bold response because we don't know, hemodynamic forward model 
besides having four uh, differential equations, has seven unknown parameters that are different. So we, we estimate those parameters together with the model. And uh, since it's not constrained by the ball, uh, those parameters fl uh, just fluctuate away and it doesn't, doesn't model, doesn't represent bold activity well. But when we have both of them together, it tracks bold, bold, bold activity and kind of reduces the noise in estimation of uh, image and fMRI. So kind of nice, but uh, not related yet to learning uh, causality, right? We, or any relations, we're doing it with a single ROI. So the natural next step is scale this up. Let's throw 64 or whatever I write, like the, the, the ones that I've used in the previous experiment and use them together. But it's not just 64 ROIs. It is uh, each, each forward uh, fMRI model has additional four uh, ROIs and seven unknown parameters. And then if you think about the way we estimate that model with particle filters, uh, you need exponentially larger number of particles than the parameters in the system, and we quickly choke, and uh, like the system saturates, we can't do anything computationally. Well, at, le at, at least until now, I don't have, well, like, by the time we got this result and we needed to scale that because that was our na natural next step, uh, we, uh, like, I couldn't get it to run uh, to get, uh, basically, it was computationally intractable. Right now, people are working hard on making particle filters to work on GPU and parallelize everything. And then maybe uh, maybe that's now the right time to come back to this model and uh, try. But at the time, <coughs> we were stuck. And uh, David came along. Um, and uh, so David had this wonderful idea. We have uh, overlapping variable experiments, and we can infer the whole thing. So well, this is, those are like experiments with overlapping variables, image and fMRI, and even the analogy is even stronger because uh, arguably, I don't know if any EMG people in the room. No, okay, well, EMG can't measure subcortical surfaces, subcortical structures of the brain. Uh, it's just signal deteriorates with the depth. And fMRI doesn't have a problem with this. So the variables don't overlap. Like there are some variables that fMRI measures. So I came to David and asked him, look, this is a low hanging fruit, let's do it. But turn, turned out uh, the thing wasn't that easy, and uh, David uh, gave me tons of arguments that why it wouldn't work. And uh, one of the biggest arguments was, well, they, they're collected at totally, totally different time scale. And we don't know what happens to causal systems when they are measured at different time scales, estimated at different time scales, and how to merge those things. Are they even mergeable? So here's, the, here's how this came. Uh, uh, and uh, well, we needed a theory because it turned out that we couldn't just Google it and, oh, this is how you t uh, collect the data on slow time scale and infer what happened on the, at the faster time scale. So we needed to think of it about ourselves. And here's what we're talking about here. Neural activity, about 100 milliseconds uh, time interval. That's when the signals pro propagate. That's when it happens. And then the fMRI and uh, IMG measures it right there. It's it can can do kilohertz easily. And fMRI, it's about two seconds. Although right now you can do it faster, but because there are certain uh, con convolution effects there in hemodynamics, that wouldn't necessarily help. And we want to infer this uh, interaction of the ROIs and the network. And all images are uh, borrowed from the web. If you see yours, please. Uh, and Take it with understanding. So, uh, so what, what causal inferences can be made in this situation? What can we do about, uh, you know, collecting data here and uh, inferring something about causal interactions at this time scale? So, two challenges. One, uh, the easier one, but necessarily, it's the forward challenge. If you know the interaction causal network at the true causal time scale, and I will tell you how much I've undersampled. Can you tell me what the network will look like? And another is backward inference. Oh, look, we collected some, some data. We don't know how much our uh, measurement device undersamples, and then we infer the structure. Can you tell me what are uh, what what is the ground truth or what could have generated it? We went with uh, the following dynamic uh, Bayesian network representation. It's first order Markov causally sufficient. 
and uh, yeah, no isochronal edges. And I can justify each of the assumptions, uh, but because, for example, we're saying no isochronal variables because we can always say that the true causal time scale, time scale is fine enough that uh, we we don't nothing happens instantaneously. There is there needs time to, to, for propagation. And then uh, first order Markov is we're assuming me memoryless system. So in order to transfer something across the time time uh, step, you have to store it somewhere or pass through some other variable. So that's that's our model. And as you see, it's uh, stationary uh, across time. There. So here's what happens with uh, the ground truth here at uh, time scale one, the true causal time scale, when you have the sample by two, by three, by four, and so forth. So as you see, the network gets denser and it changes, and I'm not showing all of the edges here. Uh, there are isochronal edges. So uh, you can keep unrolling the network and figuring out computing all the paths. Basically, an edge here is a path of length three in the network that you unroll. Uh, in the true network that you know. But we found that it's much easier and more convenient to work with this representation, uh, with compressed representation. So in the compressed representation, we know we're operating at first or with first or mark of assumption. So each arrow here is from past to future. So it has uh, weight one. And uh, then there are those uh, bi-directed edges, they encode uh, an observed common causes, and they're always isochronal. So we have a theorem for that, it's all provable. So that's why it's easy to interpret at any under sampling rate, it's still a compressed graph, still each edge uh, has weight one, and uh, isochro uh, the bidirected edges have weight zero there. <clears throat> so uh, looking at this representation, at the compressed representation, is very helpful because you immediately see patterns or classes of graphs with respect to their undersampling behavior. So if your true graph is a compressed graph, uh, is a DAG, it doesn't, it, it is, even if it's a DAG in the dynamic Bayesian, uh, the split steps uh, sense, it will always be a DAG, it's forward influence. It doesn't have to be a DAG in the compressed representation. But if it is still a DAG, here's two possibilities that happen under undersampling. One is that at a certain rate, uh, everything becomes independent. You will not be detect able to detect dependencies. And another yeah, is no directed dependencies, and all dependencies that you can see are undirected. And there is another case if we, so here's you, you, you see cycles, but they're all time resolved cycles. Right? Uh, interesting structures are strongly connected components, and uh, the strongly connected component here has this particular property, if you look at all of the simple loops within the strongly connected component, and any strongly connected component it can be decomposed into a set of simple loops, the loops that, that don't come from the same node second time, just visit a node, uh, each node appears just once on, on the path, on the circular path. So look at all of the simple loops at their length and the greatest common divisor of the length. If GCD is one, then uh, the component will collapse or converge into a super click when every edge is is there, every possible edge is there. If GCD is not one, then depending on how much you undersample, you see repeated structures like with this guy. So this is the true graph. This is undersampled by two, by three, by four, by five. Again, you see the same graph and so on. So uh, this is the forward model, right? And now, the task is, uh, the task is not, well. Now we know some of the classes of behaviors, uh, how how the true graphs look like, and uh, what what does it mean, how they will look like and undersampled. Uh, but the task is to go backwards. Okay, here's the graph that is measured. Can we uh, say something about it? If you notice that a super click graph for any strongly connected component with GCD of one they all will look as a super click at some point, right? So there is uh, under determination uh, of, of, of some sort. You, you, you can have many solutions that generate or are, are can generate at some undersampling rate, the same graph. And uh, then for a known undersampling rate, 
we found it very hard initially to even think about the problem how do we backwards so we decided to focus here on the simple problem well, i assume we know that it is understanding understandable by two so it's just one time step uh, from the true graph what can we do there and if you notice so here's the graph that is the true graph at the true causal time scale and this is its version or i mean there is one, uh, this is one to one uh, relationship in that sense. If you have the graph, you, you know this is how it will look at the next time, time step, right? So if, if you undersampled it by just one. So th this is the G2 version of this graph. Then each edge here is actually a path of length two in this graph. And this is what those nodes represent. We know there is a node here, but we call it a virtual node because it's one of those. Uh, other nodes, we just don't know which one. And so simultaneously merging them uh, in, such a, in such way that the resulting graph will generate this graph when undersampled by one is what we're, what we're looking for. So for uh, one to one loop, right, this one with this virtual node, those are the options to merge the nodes. So uh, here's a useful lemma. Well, uh, it was a long lemma, but I decided to shorten it. Conflicts persist, basically. If you if you started adding, if you took an edge and a virtual node and say, OK, one to one, one passes from th through three and come back, comes back to one. That's my option. And then you've tested it and like, oh, no, wait, it generates an edge that is not present here. Then that that's the conflict persistence uh, lemma that says okay if, if you've generated a conflict like that that uh, a version of G one that you've tried generates extra edges with respect to uh, G two the ground truth G two the measured G two then adding more edges uh, wouldn't wouldn't remove that conflict you will still be conflicting with the graph that's kind of obvious thing so here's the the brute force or not brute force this is a uh, just a natural algorithm to pursue in this case. So we have to explain H1 and 1, 1 and 2, and so on. That's the table that you've just seen. We start with an empty graph. And one and oh, H1 to 1, the self-loop, has three possible candidates there. So we've tried, uh, we, we, we've tried each of them, but in the depth-first manner. We've, we've tried 1 to 1 to itself. And OK, it doesn't generate any conflicts. And then we've tried the next edge. So we're explaining 1 to 2 edge. And for 1 to 2, we're saying, OK, 1 goes to 1 and then goes to 2. And we, uh, we're building, uh, iteratively building up that graph. And this one doesn't have any conflict either with the ground truth graph. Well, then we go on one step more. We generate a conflict, uh, remove that edge, backtrack, try the next option, and so on. A kind of straightforward algorithm and it's uh, correct and complete it can it can generate everything and it will find the solutions that are there uh, if it would, wouldn't be slow we were done there but it was well very slow so we needed uh, and uh, the speed the efficiency of that algorithm is explained that we for e n nodes we're trying uh, n nodes for each edge so it's n to the e complexity, uh, the space of possible candidates that uh, we need to try. Then we went with additional constraints, uh, or uh, rather alternate constraints. Instead of trying to explain each edge in G2, we noticed that there are certain structures that induce much more constraints much faster than just going edge, edge by edge. For example, this pa uh, the path implies that any two candidates for merging here must have a uh, directed edge between them. So we can only try those that have uh, in, in G2, in the measure G2, that have an edge from here to there. And th those are the pairs. But then if you look at forks at, uh, well, like this is a fork. I mean, so just a graphical definition to save time. So there is only one candidate to be to be used for those two virtual nodes, and so on. So this this from from depth uh, excuse me from depth five we reduced our exponent to depth three, and also our possible candidates. You can see them here. So if we 
uh, take a log uh, of the complexity of the number uh, log ratio of the complexities of the number of candidates that are original naive but very clear and something that first comes to mind algorithm has to try potentially without accounting for the conflicts that it kind of uh, backtracks and doesn't explore the edge then uh, this is a log ratio between our new algorithm and the old algorithm it's basically for each depth here is whatever number of candidates uh, are there so if we if we do that and uh, we, we tried for 100 random graphs, for uh, eight node graphs, and for 10 node graphs. And this is a log base 10 axis there. So you can see the magnitude, uh, the, the order of magnitude of improvement. Yeah, we get about 10 orders or up a little bit more than 10 orders of magnitude of speed improvement, but potential improvement. Uh, this doesn't account that the, the slower algorithm can be pruning faster or not. So we found out that it's still is not fast enough. So uh, then uh, we've done certain additional uh, pre-computation with pre-computations, which uh, are now in the paper, but harder to explain. But we just looked at pairs of uh, constraints. So we've done some quadratic checking and pruning and uh, it employed additional constraints. What it leads to in the running example that they wish, I was showing. So for this particular graph, you only need to try those candidates. That basically means just construct the graph. You get the solution right away. Your, your branching tree turned into just a sequence from top to bottom. And what it means in terms of, well, the, we, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to show it, right? It's not that just that, but there were some lemmas that we had to prove uh, to constrain the problem further and further. Uh, so exploiting the structure of the problem heavily. And that allowed us to theoretically get to up, uh, up to 30 magnitude improvement in speed. If, if you, the space of possible candidates that the algorithm would check is 30 orders of magnitude smaller in the new version of the algorithm compared to, sorry, naive uh, but clear approach. But in practice, you only get in the medians about one to two order of magnitude improvement or five orders of magnitude improvement in actual running time for uh, some outliers, unfortunate 10% of researchers who will have to wait, you know, eight hours rather than 300 milliseconds. But uh, well, well, that, that's some ability to run everything and have upper bound in 300 milliseconds for eight node graphs is uh, helpful and I will show that uh, later. But now when we have an algorithm that you have collected data, estimated the graph, uh, G2, uh, under sample by two, and it gives you an answer, the question is, well, what will the answer be really interesting or useful? So assume a researcher goes to the lab, collects the data, estimates a graph, and goes to our algorithm, we return 300,000 of possible candidates that could have generated a graph. That wouldn't be really helpful for researcher, right? They, they would rather go and you know go to conferences and literature and prune the graph with constraints from there rather than looking at our candidates that we generated. But if it generates one, two, three, ten graphs, then maybe they can just look at them and say, oh, okay, well, I have a prior, some kind of prior knowledge that didn't go into my data collection or didn't go into, into the graph construction, which is like, oh yeah, this graph makes much more sense. We don't know. So this, the, we, want, we want to study the effect of undersampling on the equivalence classes. And the equivalence classes here are not your Markov equivalence classes. Uh, when, if you uh, used to think about uh, causal graph. So what, what we define there is given a graph, uh, undersampled graph, you don't know undersampling, any graph that is consistent, any graph at G1 at the true time scale that is consistent with this graph that can generate it at some undersampling is within its equivalence class. For this the definition shrinks even further because we go, we're looking at just one time step. So anything at, uh, so given a graph at G2, the ground truth, anything at G1 that can generate this graph with one undersampling step is within the equivalence class because they're equivalent to this procedure. So we went ahead with just six nodes because it's uh, computationally efficient and we can do very dense graphs. And we generated 100 graphs for each of the densities 
ground truth density. And the density is de defined as number of possible uh, number of present edges to the number of possible edges. And there are n square possible edges here, and 20%, uh, 25, and so on, so forth. So uh, this the height of the bar is 100%, so 100 graphs that we've tried random graphs. This is one particular example for each density and what it leads to when it's under sample. And uh, the color and the numbers uh, down here uh, for the color, they just indicate how what is the size of equivalence class. For example, for 20% density of six node graphs, the size is 90, 98 out of 100 graphs just have one unique solution. And that happens very often up to 35% density, and then you still have a unique solution. And surprisingly, even for 45% uh, density, when you measure graph as this, it's like almost every edge is present. Well, some edges are missing, like one edge is missing here uh, in this graph of 97% density. And then you get more than, we, we, uh, we cap the algorithm, we stop. After you get more than 1,000, we assume it's just, uh, not fair to give researchers this output and let them analyze it. Uh, so you see that, uh, surprisingly for us at least, that some of the solutions, well, uh, for, a, for a lot of uh, practical densities, we have unique solutions. So it's just one graph. So you, 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 you have it. So, and then we stop, we stop at the 30% because for computational reasons and uh, also, well, you, you get more non-unique solutions why to look there. And this is an example, same example, eight node graphs, uh, same uh, encoding. You, you get a lot of unique solutions up to 30% density. And then you get two uh, equivalence classes of size two. That's still useful, right? You can, you can look at the researcher that collected the data, can look at the results and say, oh, okay, well, I may collect more data or I may change my undersampling rate uh, my, uh, or get a better measurement device, basically. And uh, so on, like everything here uh, for eight node graphs, random, strongly connected components is interpretable still. Then for, for 10 node graphs, uh, we get more var variability in equivalence class in the 30%, but let's uh, look, this is all under a minute computation for 10 uh, node graphs. And this is how a 30% density 10 node graph looks like. Uh, we can go for 15 nodes to 25% and further, for, uh, but it's still, it becomes computationally intensive there. And this figure explains why. Here we fix the density of the graph to 10%, and we're just growing the number of nodes in the graph, 15, 20, and up to 35. So here's how the collected measured graph at 10% density for 35 uh, nodes looks like. It's very dense, and yet 96% of the graphs have unique solution like, like that, uh, and we can get them because we have an efficient algorithm. Uh, but this is for, when our ground truth and our measured graph is really uh, at G2, the assumption there in the algorithm makes that assumption that you, you only have to unwind or go inverse backwards in time from G2 to G1. So what if we violate that assumption and we generate graphs, we have all the ground truths here, we generate those graphs. We generate graphs and undersample them by three and feed it to the algorithm. So conveniently, the algorithm often uh, those 100% and 95% doesn't return a solution. So you can possibly detect violation or your, of your assumption about how much you've undersampled by running that algorithm. Uh, furthermore, mm, the algorithm is general. You, uh, you can extend it using uh, the same understanding of the underlying problem structure for any U, for any given fixed U. It's, if you don't care about waiting exponentially long, then it would work. But it also, it, it works quite well for small number of graphs, small densities and uh, numbers up to five we can go. But here's an example when you generate, we've generated random graphs at G1 time scale and then undersampled them by three, fed them to the algorithm, telling it that the undersampling rate now is three, not two. And uh, the algorithm found solutions and uh, less unique but still similar pattern up to 30 percent you have a lot of unique single uh, singleton solutions singleton equivalence classes 
<clears throat> but that was sort of the uh, studying the structure of equivalence classes. And the conclusions from there is, uh, oh, look, there, we were surprised that equivalence classes are so small and useful. Now synthetic data. So we generate a random SCC, convert it to a stable transition matrix, and then simulate data with just this simple, uh, that simple, autoregressive uh, process, and then subsample to rate two. And then we use just direct minimization of negative local likelihood of structure vector autoregression because it allows us to model instantaneous relationships unexplained by uh, previous time step, which is by directed edges in our in our model, we needed this uh, to work. Uh, I don't have a slide here uh, to, to show you, but uh, uh, what what happens there? So uh, our graphs, directed graphs from time step t to time step t plus one, have n square possible edges. So the number of possible graphs is two to the n square. When we have bidirected edges added to the system, we have uh, two to the n square plus n choose two possible graphs. Uh, most of those graphs you can't obtain by undersampling. So we hit that problem in this, uh, in this is edge emission, edge commission errors when I'm comparing in the undersampled space, red, and after projecting back, I'm, I'm, I have both ground truths, right? And so if we hit in this slide, when we hit a graph that doesn't have a solution, we run our algorithm, but it's just unreachable by the undersampling process. We discard it and restart until we find something that is reachable. And uh, that restart process was taking very, very, very long time but, uh, because uh, there are only few reachable graphs, as it turns out. And, and uh, like this, this kind of gives you a behavior still even that there, like sometimes you have 100% errors, but uh, very, very often you get something reasonable as an output. However, this approach by discarding your data or, or going and collecting new data is not viable uh, for actual practical use. Luckily, because we can run a H run, this, those, those, those examples are for A nodes, so it's 400 milliseconds fast. So what we do now, we take a Hamming cube for four, for eight nodes, we have a 92, a binary, binary string representation with a binary number for each node of edge, for each edge. Basically we search in the neighborhood of Hamming cube, we're running an algorithm on every neighbors one, one step away, two steps away, three steps away, four and five steps away. And then most of the time we find, uh, we don't need to restart, like somewhere within uh, this neighborhood of uh, 50 million, uh, about 50 million candidates that we uh, can, can try, we find some solution that fits. And so interestingly here, look, th this is the error, estimation error. And this is the error after we found the graph that fits and projected back and compared to the ground truth. So our, our, our knowledge about how graphs behave under undersampling and having that algorithm acts as a regularizer, additional regularizer that improves the estimation process by constraining only to uh, the graphs only, only to reasonable space that is admissible or possible. And the same, the same happens here for emission and commission. So with respect to the, to the, this is all still in progress in terms of coming back to the uh, starting theme of my talk. Now we have first results uh, on the road of creating a fusion algorithm where we can figure out what happens uh, to a fast, a fast, fast uh, sampling rate model at the, in a, in a slow sampling rate model at the same, we can put them at the same time scale with this algorithm or the algorithms in that family. And now use uh, overlapping variable model as initially intended. Uh, so, but that, that, that's the perspective. That's where we eventually will be going. But uh, with respect to this algorithm, uh, like we've learned that under sampling leads to incorrect results and we have solved the forward problem uh, a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, 
and then it took us some time to solve the inverse problem finally uh, we have something uh, some a solution not a full solution but still surprising finding after having that tool that we can poke uh, the space of uh, possible solutions with that equivalence classes often are singleton and that's very useful for practical applications uh, and so that further um, that we can regularize the estimation methods with this additional information. And for, uh, well, the, the limitations are that we're still operating in non-parametric world. So we are largely, uh, largely ignoring problems with statistics and the data. And uh, our algorithm solves only for fixed even undersampling rate. And well, for small undersampling rate, it works uh, well. But still. In the large high density graphs, we can't do anything just yet. So, thank you. Yeah. So it doesn't, like the, with the fMRI, the undersampling rate is tricky because there are other things that affect it. Like probably the approach that, okay, the undersampling rate is the only difference between MEG and fMRI is not uh, a good assumption in the end. But it is a huge factor and we need to solve it before, you know, trying to do something. Um, Plus, right now for fMRI, at MRN, we're collecting data at 250 milliseconds. So that's undersampled by two, right? With 100 milliseconds for, uh, and yeah, like I can stop there, but it's cheating because, well, actually, fMRI has other problems uh, besides just undersampling rate. Even when you have high sampling rate uh, for fMRI, you still, hemodynamic effect the convolution basically gets in the way and we don't know yet how to handle it. But the original 20, 20 times difference of undersampling rate, it, it, we, we, we've overcome that now with fast collection, fast data collection, like 64, 32 coils, scanners that can collect very fast. But still not at the true time scale though. And we don't know, 100 milliseconds. Did you notice all the, the approximate signs there in that slide? We don't really know what is the true time scale. So that's our next work that we're working on right now. Can we be agnostic to the time scale, uh, the, like without knowing what is the true time scale or what is the understanding? So, um, you know, your results with your simulations depend on the density of the graph. What is your estimate for the density of the brain graph, I mean, the photographs of the brain that you're trying to uh, model? So a couple of weeks ago, uh, I've been on a talk by Olaf Sporns talking about uh, showing anatomical graphs and uh, functional network connectivity, correlational networks side by side. And I was jumping in my seat that we need to apply the algorithm. The density is like 10% or 20% in both of them. Uh, I haven't gotten the data yet, but I, I hope they can. So uh, it looks like it is not as dense as, uh, 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 like the network, the anatomical network is dense, but the actual functional, and another thing that what what is used right now may not be as dense. So I, this is a problem and it's scary, but uh, I, I hope we can find particular cases where it's not relevant. Can the algorithm be adjusted to handle latent variables? Uh, yes, uh, and we almost know how. So maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, by fall, we'll have an algorithm. <laughs> but those are two prob uh, problems that kind of interplay. The, undersampling and latent variables. If you think of your dynamic uh, Bayesian network as a matrix that you unfold, 
uh, well, it's kind of an infinite matrix. So under sampling is you're getting rows and the latent variables, you, uh, you're getting columns and latent variables, you're getting rows. So, but the algorithms are totally different. The effects are totally, totally un unexpected, like in latent variable case. Thank you.